Yo, welcome back everybody to a brand new video here on the second channel. It is now time for the EUIC tier list. Of course, with EUIC coming up this weekend, it is going to be the biggest and one of the most important tournaments of the year. It is the first major tournament with rotation legal, and we're in a bit of an undefined meta right now. We don't really know what the best 60s are, the best cards are, the best techs are, the best lists are, and all that stuff. We're going to find out a lot of that information, though, at EUIC. Really, the best we got right now is working off of local testing, online tournaments, and talk of the town on Twitter. And obviously, a lot of this is going to be opinionated. As these are my opinions as to what I think the meta looks like heading in to EYC. If y'all are new here to the second channel, make sure to subscribe down below. We're on the road to 13,000 subs. And make sure to leave a like on the video if you wanted to enjoy it. I'll leave a link to my tier list down below in the description if you want to go try it yourself. Let me know in the comments, too, what do you think of my opinion, my tier list, and uh, what the best decks are right now in our format. A lot of the decks here are from online tournament results and from Japan. So starting these off, we got Charizard. So right now, Charizard, it's definitely one of the best decks in the format. I think everybody can agree Charizard is top tier right now. I would probably say that Pidgeyzard is better than Bibzard. Now, Bibzard, probably, I'm going to be honest, more of a tier two deck. I think Bibzard definitely is strong. It's not a bad deck, but Pidgeyzard is by far the superior way to play Charizard EX. If I was to play Charizard this weekend, to EUIC, I would rather just play Pidgeot. I think Pidgeotzard is the better build. Bibzard isn't bad, but I think Pidgeotzard just is a better deck overall. It's more consistent with what it's trying to do. And, I mean, while Charizard doesn't have a good control matchup at all, I think the Pidgeotzard build actually has a better time against control than Bibzard, at the very least. And I think Pidgeotzard is perfectly fine. I mean, it's the one that's been dominating all the tournaments right now anyways for Charizard. Bibzard got so much hype heading into this format, and then it completely just fell off and nobody really talks about it and Pidgeyzard just kind of was revealed to be the best way to play it. Now the question is, can Charizard perform well at EYC? Yeah, I think it will. It's definitely one of the top decks right now. It's probably going to be played, you know, very heavily. It's probably going to be one of the most popular decks at the tournament. It might even be the most played deck at EYC. The thing with Charizard, though, that's sketchy about it is it does seem that the meta is built around beating it. Like, especially with most decks just having answers for it. I mean, stuff like Lugia, Shempow, Arctina, Control, even, you know, Giratina, Lost Box. Like, there's so many decks right now that are built to beat Charizard. Or it just feels like Charizard is way too heavily countered right now. That doesn't mean it's a bad deck. I mean, that just means it's still going to be BDIF. I mean, Charizard is still performing really, really well, despite all these obstacles that is getting thrown its way. So Charizard is still really good. I think Pidgeyzard is the best way to play it. I'm going to put it in Tier 1. Charizard, in my opinion, is not quite S tier. There's too many things against it right now. But I do think Charizard is one of the best decks in the format. Next up, we got the Arc Piles. Arc has been revived. I mean, after rotation, Arceus did get a little bit better. I mean, before rotation, Arc was struggling a little bit. It was hard to keep up with stuff like Roaring Moon and, you know, Maraidon even. But now Arceus has kind of come back in the format. The meta slowed down a little bit, and Arc has a chance to be revived again. Now, the best way to play Arc is Arctina, which I'm going to call a tier 1.5 deck. I think Arctina, it's an okay deck. It's pretty much like the most straightforward vanilla deck in the meta right now, in my opinion. It just kind of does what it does. It's does its thing it judges your opponent some lists are playing eerie um in the deck some don't um some lists are playing aerodactyl because one of the things in my opinion that holds arctina back is that it has a really bad lugia matchup which i'm not sure you want to be taking going into euic but arctina's lugia matchup isn't fantastic even if you go first it still seems that lugia can beat you um, and that's the main issue with playing Arctina. Now, some Arctina decks are starting to incorporate a 1-1 one -one copy of Aerodactyl V-Star to help against Lugia. Though I don't know if Aerodactyl is really going to be that useful against Lugia. Because one, you have to go first. Two, you have to get a turn Aerodactyl and a turn one Aerodactyl V-Star and get the Aerodactyl into the active spot. And all by doing this, you don't have access to Starbirth. And to pull the Aerodactyl off, you have a lack of good supporters. Because a lot of the time, Arctina is just having Judge Iono and boss, and maybe an Eerie. So, I don't know if the Aerodactyl is really that good against Lugia. It's probably better for other situations, like in the Mirror Match or against Iron Hands, but I guess, you know, if you want to increase the chance of beating Lugia slightly with Arctina, you could play the Aerodactyl. Um, but yeah, Arctina is good otherwise. I think it can beat a lot of other stuff. It's got a fine matchup against Zard. Um, I think your Lost Box matchups are pretty good. Uh, your Control matchup isn't bad either, in my opinion. If you play a Turo, the matchup isn't too bad. Arctina is like a perfectly fine deck. It just kind of does what it does, just very straightforward, simple stuff. 
Um, then we got Arc Armor Rouge. I wanted to mention this deck here. So I'm going to put it in the Rogue category. I think this deck is very fascinating, and I think it's one of those decks that, until somebody kind of does well with it, it's going to be one of those more Rogue-friendly decks. It's an interesting way to play Arceus, and it, have, it has had some results so far in Japan, which I think is helping its case a little bit. But I don't know if I would put Arc Armor Rouge any higher than in, like, the Rogue category at the moment. Though this deck definitely has some untapped potential for sure. And then there's Arc Goo. Same thing. Probably a Rogue deck. I think Arc Picks is slightly better. If I'm, well, there's also the Arc Goo Vulpix deck. You can combine the two together. But if you're playing Arceus Gujra by itself with no Vulpix, it's probably a Rogue deck. If you're playing Arc with a Vulpix, or if you want to play Arc Vulpix Gujra, whichever one, I think with Vulpix is better. Vulpix is just really strong right now. It's really good against Shen Pao, really good against Charizard. Um, yeah, the Vulpix is definitely one of the better ways to play Arceus at the moment over, like, it's not as good as Arctina, uh, but it is another solid way to play the deck at the moment. So I think Arc Picks is actually not a bad deck, and maybe somebody is just waiting to kind of crack the code on a good Arc Vulpix deck. Because um, one of the things I don't like about Arc Vulpix is that it has a bad Lugia matchup. Look at that. All these Arc Piles have bad matches to Lugia. I wonder why. Um, yeah, Arc Picks not great against Lugia, but definitely good into some other meta decks. Got a good Zard matchup, and uh, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I think your control matchup's good, too, because Vulpix has Shred. Those are, in my opinion, like the four main Arc Piles right now. Arc Gudra, Arc Vulpix, Arc Armor Rouge, and Arc Tina. It's kind of the four main ways to play Arc. There could be other Arc decks in the woodwork, so waiting to pop up. You never know. Um, next up, I want to talk about the Roaring Moon Duo deck. So, probably Tier 2.5. I actually do like the deck, though. I did a video on the deck recently on the main channel, and I actually liked it quite a bit. I thought this deck actually was pretty solid. I mean, I think it's got a good control matchup. Um... I don't know about your other matchups. Like, I don't know if your Zard matchup's that great. I'm not too sure about, you know, your matchup against stuff like Shen Pao. I think your Guardi matchup's pretty solid. Your Arctina matchup's probably okay, too. I think the the one prize, Roaring Moon, Roaring Moon duo deck, it's not a bad combo deck. It's definitely decent. Is it better than Ancient Box, though, is going to be the main question. And I guess we'll get into that later on in this video. But I think this deck's, like, probably true 2.5. Like, it's not a bad deck at all. I wouldn't expect it to be super popular, but it's a really interesting archetype that I think actually does have some legs. Um, next up is Bayonet. Now, I think Bayonet's also to 2.5. It's another one of those decks that kind of just needs a good 60 and a good performance to actually break through the meta and kind of push itself into any higher than a tier 2.5 because it's certainly not a bad deck. And I think Bayonet's got a lot of potential. Um, there's the Bayonet Gardevoir deck, kind of like the pre-format Bayonet deck, doing pretty good right now. I think it even won an online tournament. And then there's even the Bayonet Espathra Zatu Toolbox deck. Um, that also, I'm pretty sure, won an online tournament. So these Bayonet decks are definitely interesting. It's doing good in the online tourney scene. We'll just have to see if that translates over into actual tournament results at EUIC. Though Bayonet definitely doesn't look like a bad deck. There's a couple different ways you can play it. You can build it with the Espathra, or you can build it with the Gardevoir engine, which is the kind of old version of the deck. But yeah, I think Bayonet's definitely an interesting spot right now in our meta. And honestly, Bayonet doesn't seem too terrible at the moment. Um, next up is Shen Pao. Probably tier one. I think Shen Pao is a pretty safe bet to be in a tier one spot right now. It is a very strong archetype. Um, it does have its consistency issues. Obviously, the deck does have, you know, very reliability on its setup, like the stage twos and stuff. And, you know, sometimes you just kind of have those typical Shen Pao hands. So Shen Pao hands aren't as bad anymore because now you don't have cross switcher in the format. So I guess your hands aren't as clogged up as they used to be. But yeah, Shen Pao is pretty good. Um, the one bad matchup most of the time is going to be control. Your control matchup is pretty bad. The one thing that does also hurt Shen Pao, though, is that if Eerie becomes a lot more popular, I think Shen Pao gets a lot worse. I mean, that's one of Shen Pao's biggest weaknesses right now is Eerie. So I think Shen Pao is a very solid deck. Um, very high rolly, kind of sacky, kind of luck based deck. You know what I mean? It's on that like category of like you need to run hot with the deck in order for the deck to actually have a deep run. Um, otherwise, the deck just kind of is mid, but it is still good. And I think definitely we'll have to see how Shen Pao fluctuates because of the popularity of Eerie. Even Zar decks are starting to play Eerie now, uh, specifically just to beat Shen Pao, because Shen Pao obviously sometimes will have those items in their hand, like the Superior Retrievals, the Prime Catcher, the Rare Candies, and you can Eerie them away and really make it hard for the Shen Pao player to keep up in a match. So that's the one thing that's going to hold the Shen Pao player back is going to be the popularity of Eerie. But going into UIC, Shen Pao is not a bad deck for sure. Um, decent play for sure. Next up is the Pidgeot Control deck. I'm going to put that in tier 1.5. I think Pidgeot Control is a very powerful deck that 
if piloted by the right player, this deck can have a deep run. It's not a deck that anyone can just pick up and do well with. It is a very hard deck to pilot. It's probably the hardest deck to play in the format, to be honest. Um, the Pidgeot Control deck has a lot of different things you can do. It's got a lot of different plays. The deck also just plays a ton of different, like, random stuff. Like, obviously, it's not really a Snorlax deck. It does play Snorlax, and Snorlax is one of its win conditions, but it's not really a Snorlax deck. It does play differently. You have all these other Pokemon, like the Luxray um, V in the deck. You got the Radiant Charizard, the Shiyu. Some Pidgeot lists are even playing a Wigglytuff EX, which is also kind of insane. So Pidgeot Control definitely is a very hard deck to pilot properly. Um, and I think if, you know, a good player who knows how to play the deck plays it to you, I see there's a good chance they're going to do, you know, really good at the tournament. Because Control, in my opinion, is in a fantastic spot right now. But that begs the question, how good is Pidgeot Control um, overall? And then, of course, we got the Dialga Matang deck. Um, probably like tier 2.5. I actually do think this deck is kind of decent. Um, it does have legs. It's not a bad deck at all. Its matchup spread isn't terrible, um, in my opinion. Like, maybe you're going to struggle a little bit against, like, some decks. Like, probably, like, Iron Hands might be a little tough. Lugia might be a little tough. But I, other than that, I think Dialga, honestly, isn't even that bad of a deck. It, it's basically like the Bayonet right now. It's, it reminds me a lot of where Bayonet is, where it's like, if the deck has a deep run, has a good run in a tournament, I can definitely see Dialga Matang actually seeing play. So I'm going to call it a tier 2.5. It's, like, barely, like, okay, it's, like, on the border of being a rogue deck, basically. And it probably is a rogue deck, but I'm going to give a little bit more credit to Dialga Matang. Um, but, I mean, in my opinion, it is, like, it's basically on the border of being a rogue deck. Um, Lugia time. Yeah, Lugia Sinchino, easy tier 1 deck. I mean, Lugia is so good right now. It's real, like, only bad matchup is basically just Iron Hands. Like, the uh, Iron Hands future deck is, like, Lugia's only bad matchup right now. And it's also one of the big decks for EUIC. I think a lot of top players have been talking about this deck. Lugia has been doing really good in the online tournaments. Yeah, Lugia definitely is looking really good right now. It's one of those decks that, like, if this deck literally just sets up perfectly turn two, it's really hard to beat. Like, double Archeops is really scary right now. And obviously, the deck has a great matchup into Charizard now. That was the only thing holding Lugia back before rotation was its matchup against Charizard sucked. But now that Charizard is a little bit easier to beat because you now have Sinchino, um, the deck has now risen in popularity. And I think that Lugia definitely is one of the top decks for EUIC. It's also one of the big decks right now that can actually take down control relatively easily, in my opinion. Um, that's another kind of big thing in uh, Lugia's favor. And yeah, Lugia's got a lot of good matchups. Its main bad matchups are going to be decks that play Iron Hand. So we're talking Shampao, which I, I do think Shampao is actually a bit better, a bit easier to beat than Lost Box, Lost Box being the other one. And then obviously Lugia's worst matchup by far is the Turbo Iron Hands deck. Next up is his Pathra. Um... Probably Rogue. I mean, I think it's like, if you're going to play as Pathra by itself, it's worse than playing it with Bayonet. If you're not playing it with Bayonet, I think it's worse than the Bayonet build, or at least it's more Rogue than the Bayonet build. I can actually see as Pathra having a day two at EUIC. That'll maybe be like a hot take I have for my predictions video, but as is kind of a cool deck. It's actually been doing some, you know, results in online tournaments, have been doing okay in the tournaments. The Bayonet build definitely, I think, is the better way to play as Pathra. Um, but if you're going to play it by itself as, like, a Psychic Toolbox deck with Zatu, it's not a bad deck either. It's just more of a rogue deck than anything else. Kind of an unestablished archetype. But the Bayonet build's not bad. Uh, next up, we have Future Hands. I think this deck is a solid... That's a tough one, actually. Would it be Tier 1 or Tier 2? I actually... You know what? Honestly, Tier 1.5 isn't a terrible place to put it. Um, I think Future Hands is a scary deck. It's one of those decks that I think a lot of people are really under um, representing right now in our meta. I do think that Future Hands is one of the... Um, biggest decks that people are not really looking at at the moment. It's a very strong deck. It's got a great Lugia matchup, which is fantastic. Its matchup spread isn't bad at all. I think your matchup against Shampao's decent. Your Lugia matchup is insane. I think you can actually beat Control, too. As long as you're playing Psychic Energy in the deck, I think your Control matchup's, like, perfectly fine, too. Um, yeah, Iron Hands is genuinely a scary deck. This Future Hands deck actually is a threat, in my opinion, and is a deck that I think a lot of players are not really looking at going into UIC, and I think that's going to bite them, because I think I could, I can see this deck doing well. Is it the new age of Maridon? I don't know. Is it the new Maridon? I think it's, I don't know if it's better than Maridon, but it definitely is kind of in that same vein of where Maridon was. I do think Future Hands is a very scary deck. It's one biggest obstacle. It's probably just going to be Charizard. It doesn't seem like the deck has a great answer to Charizard. It's a tough matchup. Even if you play Raichu V in the deck, the matchup's still tough. But other than that, I think a Future Hands is a very strong deck, and I think that it's a little underrepresented, but I think it has potential to do good at UIC. Um, next up, we have the Ancient Box deck. More of a pile, probably tier 2.5. I think Ancient Box is definitely a deck that we're waiting to see a good 60 come out for the deck first. I don't think 
we've seen the deck be cracked yet. My other issue, though, is tends to be a little bit on the bricky side. It relies heavily on your Greninja not being prized. Your supporters are a little flimsy. You have Explorer's Guidance and Sada. The deck definitely can brick a lot. It's a little similar to like how Reggie's used to play. And I'm talking Reggie's post Silver Tempest. I'm not talking Silver Tempest Reggie's. I'm talking the post Silver Tempest Reggie's deck. When the deck gained like Supron and Lum Energy, but never really went anywhere. That's kind of where I see Ancient Box right now. It is a bit of a pile. I do think that the Roaring Moon um, dual build is better than the Coridon build. The Coridon build isn't bad, but the Coridon build just kind of is a bit more brickier. Coridon's not as good as Roaring Moon EX, and it has a worse Charizard matchup. So that's my issues with it. Bit of a pile, but it's a pile that maybe somebody can figure out a good 64. I can see it. I don't know about going tier 2. Maybe maybe tier 2, but I don't know about tier 1.5. Um, but for now, I got uh, I got Ancient Box in tier 2.5. Um, I'm just unrefined decks. So that's kind of why I'm not throwing in Rogue. Uh, same with Future Box. Um, the non, just straight Iron Hands build. I think Future Box is worse than Iron Hands. Iron Hands is probably the better way to play it. But Future Box isn't bad. Having like a toolbox of attackers, having good type coverage with the leaves, maybe having the Iron Boulder in the deck. Maybe you're playing the Iron Valiant or whatever. I think Future Box isn't a bad deck. It's just same thing as Ancient Box. We're just waiting to see a good 60 come out. And maybe the deck can actually be a bit better. That's kind of where I lie right now with my opinion on Future Box. Um, then, of course, we got the Lost Box uh, deck here. Uh, I think it's tier 1.5. I think Lost Box is, like, fine. Um, I think your Zard matchup is, like, the only matchup that's slightly tough. I think your Lost Box, like, Lost Box isn't bad against Lugia. Um, I don't think it's bad against Champau either. Um, Arctina is a little scary because they have Judge and Eerie, but you do have Hoopa EX, which is kind of one of the big cards in the deck. The Hoopa does make this deck a lot better. I think it's matchup against the uh, Turbo Hands deck isn't bad either. Um, your Giratina matchup's okay. And if you're playing Spirit Tomb, I think you have a great matchup into Control. Those are my opinions on the Lost Box deck. Lost Box tier 1.5. I mean, there's a ton of players that just love to play Lost Box. I'm sure that that'll translate into UIC. Like, all these Lost Box players from the previous format are probably just going to adapt and play it again in EUIC. Most likely, that's most likely we're going to see happen. Um, it's, in my opinion, tier 1.5. I think the deck is pretty good. Um, it's pretty solid stuff. It is, it's just Lost Box at the end of the day. Um, then we got Guardi, probably tier 2. Um, it's kind of in the middle of, like, it's a pile, but it's not really a pile. And it's actually, like, kind of playable. Um, it has been doing decent in some online tourneys. Once again, it's a little too early to tell how good this deck really is. It's not, like, set in stone like something like Lugia or Charizard is, but I do think Gardevoir is still a deck to respect a little bit. Like, I don't think it's ever going to be, like, a popular deck, but I can definitely see Guardi having some day twos at EYC. It actually seems like it's not in a bad spot right now. Its biggest obstacle will obviously be the spam of Lost Vacuum. That's one of the worst cards this deck can encounter, but, I don't know, Guardi doesn't seem terrible still. It's not a bad deck at all. I would justifiably put in tier two for sure um i don't think it's a bad pick for tier two goldango um probably two 2.5 goldango is not a bad deck um though i think with the popularity of eerie it's kind of going to throw me off on playing it because i'm going to play a deck that loses to eerie i'd rather play shempow because at least you don't get bodied by eerie as hard goldango is really cool and goldango strong when you build up a huge hand the problem is you have a huge hand you're probably going to have at least a couple like good cards in there like energy retrievals and then you're going to get eeried and you're going to cry. That's the big problem I have with Goldango. Goldango seems good on paper, but when you actually play it and you go up against decks with eerie, the deck sucks. So that's my issue because Goldango is worse against eerie because you're constantly having to draw cards in order for the deck to function, which means there's a good chance you're just going to have a handful of like superior retrievals and then you're going to get eerie. Now you could maybe play like Silene in the deck to like counteract that, but that's my main issue with Goldango right now. Just Eerie, it's just kind of annoying for the deck. And I think if Eerie's going to be popular, Goldango's probably just not good, which unfortunately sucks because I love Goldango. But Eerie is just such a dumb card that I just don't see Goldango being good with Eerie because it's just worse in Eerie than Shempo is. Because Shempo a lot of the time will have like maybe like six or seven card size hands after, you know, they're done their turn. Goldango's probably going to have a bigger hand by like 10 cards and good chance you're going to get Eerie and then you're going to lose your retrievals and you're going to lose the game. Gouging Fire. Huh. I like the deck. I think Gouging Fire is like tier 2.5. Another deck that's a little unrefined. It did win that Thailand Regionals. And I definitely want to put some stock in it. I'm not saying Gouging Fire is bad. It reminds me a lot of like the past format uh, Roaring Moon deck. Kind of seems like it's the same thing where it's like a speedy beat stick deck. Yeah, Gouging Fire is better than people give it credit for. I kind of want to put it in like the same category where like the other Roaring Moon deck is. Because um, I don't think either deck is bad. I think they're both like kind of not the same deck, but they're very similar in my opinion. The uh, Gouging Fire Moon decks are... Pretty similar. 
So, yeah, I like Gashing Fire. Maybe top of tier 2.5, maybe below the Roaring Moon dual deck. All right, we got Control. Snorlax. I think Snorlax is tier 1. I 100% think Snorlax is a very good deck right now. It is extremely popular. Now, just because it's popular doesn't mean it's good. Though I do think in this case, Snorlax is very good. I actually think that one of the things that makes Snorlax so good, much like Charizard, it's getting very heavily respected right now. At the very least, decks need to respect Snorlax. Like, more than they maybe even need to respect Charizard. Now, Charizard... It's not as easy to tech for. I mean, yeah, you can play Iron Leaves and Team Devo sometimes, but Snorlax is a bit harder to tech for. You have to play Switches or Turos, and sometimes you just kind of clog up your own deck's consistency. Like if I'm like Charizard, for example, when they were playing the one-one Gengar in their deck, it felt a little awkward because then all of a sudden you have to put a one-one Gengar in your deck. Like, is that even worth it just to tech for one matchup? And, and then all of a sudden Snorlax starts playing like Luxray and Reversal Energy to counter the Gengar, and then that, now that's just bad. So Snorlax definitely is a deck that I think is very strong right now. I'm going to put in Tier 1. I don't care what anyone says. I think Snorlax is one of the best decks in the format. It's a very powerful archetype. Stall needs to be respected right now. Going into UIC, Snorlax is a very strong deck. And if you're not respecting Snorlax, if your deck doesn't have a great way to beat Snorlax, I think you're not going to do good because you're going to most likely hit a Snorlax. Snorlax is very popular right now, and I think that you definitely need to respect it in our current format. Uh, next up is Sablezard. Uh, tier 2, not a terrible deck. It did lose Clara, obviously a bit of a big loss, but Sablezard's not bad. It's just one of those decks we're kind of waiting to see the best 60. We've been seeing some Sablezard lists playing Iron Hands in the deck now instead of, like, Roaring Moon of, like, the past format, but definitely a deck that I think we're waiting to kind of see the best way to play the deck, but I don't think Sablezard is in a bad spot either. Tier 2. I think it's, like, a slightly worse version of the Paradox build, or maybe it's better than Paradox, because Charizard is a strong attacker. Um... Maridon, probably tier 2.5, maybe even a rogue deck. Um, Maridon's definitely a cute deck right now in our format, but I don't know if it's any higher than tier 2.5. Uh, maybe we're waiting to see a good 60 come out. Uh, Maridon has had some results in Japan, by the way, uh, post-rotation, so it's definitely, like, not dead, but we'll have to see if it gets a day 2 at a UIC. Um, it, is it worse in future hands? Probably, or it could be better than future hands. Who knows? Maybe Maridon is actually good, and we're all sleeping on it, or maybe it's just now just a pile because it no longer has access to Flaffy. Raging Bolt, Tier 2.5. Another deck, though, that I do think has potential. Now, there is a ton of ways to play Raging Bolt. In fact, there's a lot of ways to play it. And that's kind of the thing that makes Raging Bolt so tough to decide as to how good it really is. Because I think that with all the different possibilities of ways to play it, it's one of those decks that we're just kind of waiting to see the best archetype of it before we can call it a good deck. Because I do think Raging Bolt has potential to be good. With all the different ways you can play it, I think it has potential, man. It's a strong card. It does a lot of damage. It can KO anything in one hit. It's a very scary card. The thing is, we just have to figure out a good 60 for it. We have to figure out the best partners for it. And that's the thing that's going to hold Raging Bolt back. Um, but I can definitely see a Raging Bolt or two in day two. And maybe that'll help us decide where Raging Bolt is in our new format. Lost Tina. I think Tina is like probably tier two. It's, I don't know. I kind of want to put it a bit higher. I actually don't hate Tina right now. I think Tina is actually not a bad deck. Um, uh, you know what? No, I could see Tina being tier 1.5. I don't know. It's kind of tough to decide where I want to put Tina right now. I don't know if it's a tier 1 deck or, well, it's not, a, I don't think it's tier 1, but I do think it's like at least tier 1.5 maybe. I don't know. That's kind of, I'm wavering on that. Tina is a bit of a pile now, and it also loses access to Roxanne Path, which does hurt it, but it has had a lot of good online tournament results. And honestly, it doesn't seem like a terrible deck. It's got a good control matchup, good Zard matchup. I think the one thing maybe that's a bit awkward is your Lugia matchup's not very good. That's kind of always been a problem with Tina in general, even before the format. But Tina definitely isn't a bad deck. I think it's like tier 1.5 right now, heading into EYC. It's definitely not a bad deck at all. It seems kind of strong. Seems good. I could see a lot of Tina at EYC. And then Great Tusk Mill, uh, probably tier 2.5. Uh, we haven't really seen Great Tusk have like a super good result yet, which I think does hold it back. But it is another deck where maybe we're just waiting to see it have one good performance. It does seem like a slightly worse version of, like, a control deck, though. Like, if you're going to play a deck like this, why not just play, like, a control deck, right? So and that's kind of the thing. Great Tusk isn't bad, though, but I don't think it's any higher than, like, 2, 2.5 right now. It is a bit of a pile. Um, it's kind of clunk it in there with, like, ancient boxes. Like, maybe it's good, and they might see what our 2 and day 2. But I don't ever see the deck having any more, any more popularity than just, like, that type of deck. But... There you go. That's my tier list for UIC. Uh, I don't think there's a deck in S tier right now. I do think there are decks that are at the top of the table. I do think Charizard, Lugia, Shempow, and Snorlax are like the four big decks right now to play. And then obviously everything below it, just kind of how you pick and choose. And I do think this is kind of an early prediction, obviously. It's a little too early to tell what truly is the best deck. 
post UIC will be a lot more interesting. When I do a tier list for Orlando regionals after UIC, we'll kind of see where the meta shifts after UIC. And that's where things are going to get exciting. This is my opinion on where the meta is right now. If I was going to UIC, what would I play? I'm not too sure. I don't know. I maybe would play like Zard. Um, I could see myself playing Lost Box too, um, for sure. But I, I don't know. I definitely have to see where UIC goes. I got more UIC content coming out this week. Best decks, predictions video, all that good stuff. Um, on the channel below, I think of the uh, chills down below in the description. What do you think of my opinion on the meta right now and all that good stuff? Well, uh, yeah, I think that's about it for me. Hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, leave a like, and I'll leave a link to this chills down below if you want to go do it yourself. And I'll catch you on another video here on the second channel. Oh, bye bye.